Hey, Owen, what's up, man? Hey, man. Uh, yeah, so for anybody who hasn't jumped into one of these before, these are fortnightly AMAs. We normally kick off by giving a quick update on any, well, any round of news that we have over the last fortnight. A lot of what we're doing right now, I guess, is more in preparation for getting our staking farms up and running to get our Ethereum bridge set up so that everybody can start getting across on that again. Uh, we are working hard on that one. That's uh, taken a little bit longer than we would have kind of thought it would. We are working with a couple of partners now to see what we can do about getting that, I suppose, moved along a little bit more quickly. We'd also have news over the next two weeks on the partnership that we noted in our white paper and have not yet been able to reveal. But over the next two weeks, we'll be able to give you all the full rundown on that. Outside of that, Skylar, do we have any other news outside of that? The uh, the CSGO event. Uh, so it now it has an official date, and that is going to be going live on the 16th. So the 16th of October is when our CSGO event will be going live. Just make sure you email me because I see a lot of people setting up teams, but not a lot of people actually emailing me to confirm their teams. I've only had one email so far, and I've seen maybe like four or five teams total in the community alone uh, set up. So just make sure you send me an email so that way i can uh put you guys on the roster uh we're gonna be having uh some some twitch people uh commentating and uh yeah um again the prize is four thousand uh us dollars total two thousand dollars of usdc one thousand dollars of axie and one thousand dollars of dogecoin yeah absolutely if any of you do know any communities that would be interested in that do spread it on to them uh four thousand uh, four thousand us dollars worth in prize money is actually pretty significant for a lot of gaming competitions that would be i suppose more kind of ad hoc and not set up around a large event or anything so do get the word out especially if you know anybody who can say post it up on any popular subreddits or anything like that Let's set of that then we also have the pools over at polycat which should be hopefully coming back online soon so uh, their terminology is a tank so people who want to be able to stake say uh, their native token paw will be able to get rewards in dojira the actual farm itself is still up and running so for anybody who is uh for anybody who is actually farming out the paw token with dojira and matic or with dojira paw pairs you'll be able to jump in on that we are also setting up consider the name of work in progress at the moment we're right now calling it dojira university but in short it's a large how-to section on how you'll be able to say create liquidity and jump into so it's more of the niche DeFi things that a lot of people are kind of only figuring out now or jumping into for the first time after we moved across the Polygon. These were a lot more common a while ago, but Ethereum gas fees unfortunately meant that a lot of people had to jump out of it and the knowledge wasn't really passed on unless you were after already moving on to say the smart chain or over on the Polygon or any of the chains really that have more reasonable gas prices. So no liquidity pairs are still a new concept to a lot of people that are jumping into it just now but we have some really good guides that we're working on both text and video guides so we're going to be hoping to get those out in the very near future and up online for you all to take a look at all right uh do you want to start the questions yeah sounds like okay. a good idea let's go perfect so the first one when is the v2 contract coming to ethereum i know you covered that a little bit in the intro but uh, any types of tentative dates yeah so right now we're hoping to have it on there before the 8th so that'll be one week from now unfortunately we can't make any hard promises on it we were hoping to have it on there a lot sooner than this so it is right now our top priority it's getting it bridged over onto ethereum and making sure that we have that up and running as soon as possible the reality is that while everything that we're building is being done on polygon and you know the gas prices are probably the most massive part of that one that we can kind of put into words on it but a lot of people still enjoy trading on ethereum and in particular there's a lot that we would see in around say heavier buyers and sellers that for people that would say be trading a couple of ethereum at a time the gas fees as much as we don't like to think that it would um we don't like to think that it's little for anybody, but when people are trading a couple of Ethereum at a time, people that would be in a whale class, they tend to actually they tend to actually stick on Ethereum. So that is a very large important stepping stone for us in making sure that we get this kind of pushed across and make sure that anybody who wants to just hold Dojira rather than jumping in on any of the DeFi stuff or get into any staking for the new titles we're bringing out, uh, we want to make sure that they're able to do that. 
So it is an extremely high priority and we're hoping before the 8th of October. Yeah, hopefully within the next week, we'll have that up and running and we'll keep you all updated on that too. Any thoughts on the Phantasma chain? It is supposedly built for gaming and NFTs. I've never really heard of that one. I wouldn't have you. I actually haven't. Um, I will do a look into that and I'll see, yeah, see what kind of stuff they're building on it. But I have not heard about it yet. See, there were a couple of newer chains that were coming out in around the time we were looking at Polygon and some of them which weren't battle tested. So we've had a look over a couple of them and like the reality is that a lot of the stuff we're building would have also worked great on say Avalanche and Solana etc. Uh, the reality is that Polygon was battle tested and it is still coming in as I believe it is still by far the cheapest in terms of gas and I believe it's still up there as in kind of above what we actually need in terms of speed. So that was why when it was coming over to the point of, you know, dropping onto the Polygon chain, why we kind of stuck with that. We're certainly still looking at any new chains and any new blockchain technology that might, you know, help us out in what we're building. But right now, unless a chain has, say, a terrific advancement in, say, speed, as, as in getting it to literally instant and free, there's not going to be a huge amount of point in us actually moving to any other chain. Polygon has a very developed ecosystem. It's been very battle tested. It's uh, been pen tested from here to the end of the earth. There's, yeah, th there's a lot to say about sticking with Polygon. I know that when Solana was coming out, there was a fairly serious amount of FOMO from a lot of projects saying, oh, we have to get on there because you know people are buying it at the moment. And that's great when things are pumping and stuff like that. If that's if that's what you're looking for, you just want to kind of ride that wave. But I think Polygon is one of the it's one of the safest choices for us because it's not a network that's going to go anywhere. And there are still improvements lined up for it. Even when we see Ethereum 2.0 approaching, Polygon still fits into that extremely well and we will be bridged across. I mean, Polygon is a layer two roll up on Ethereum. So it's really a very long term look that we had on it when we said, no, we're sticking with Polygon on this, particularly in that. It has all the technology we need to do everything we want to do and in fact a little bit more but uh still really good question i will still take a look into that chain on it and yeah if there's something in there like i've said before i have absolutely nothing against the idea of having multiple coins and multiple chains or anything like that so you have to something that we see on there that might be worth looking into yeah certainly never say never all right and what are the exact objectives for q4 specifically were all q3 goals fulfilled and when we'll be able to see that update on the website uh so on that last one i can answer that briefly uh so we're still looking at the roadmap making sure that everything is is um possible everything is some, like things that we can meet and uh we'll update that uh once we get that new website up and running yeah exactly and on the Q3 goals and what we have in line for Q4 coming on top of it, I think the scope of Doji are massively changed during Q3. A lot of that, was, as I've said before, was in thanks to that summer lull that we had. And again, I'm, I'm hesitant to call it a bear market. I don't think it's a bear market when Bitcoin is still jumping between 30 and 40 grand. But that was a time that we were able to take, sit down and kind of hash out exactly what we could do over the long term and start doing up proof of concepts around all of that stuff. I, I think the issue in Q3 with ourselves on a lot of tokens is that we knew what, say, we were capable of doing on, say, a personal level, as in what we could develop, but we didn't really spend long enough looking at what the market really needed. Like, one of the biggest things we had in development for Q3 was our gaming SDK, which was originally proposed by um, a, an older staff member who was uh, departed us by now. But in taking a look over what he kind of wanted to build on that and what we were able to kind of bring to market on it one of the largest parts was that there, there was no real there was no real fit for it they were already they're already you know blockchain relevant sdks that were out and there was nothing that we'd really be able to add on top of it we might be able to do it a bit cheaper but i don't think right now that's where crypto needs to go in the development sense we don't need to look at things getting cheaper for developers, we need to look at things getting cheaper for the actual consumers as in affordable that they can sit down and get things running and jump into it. So it really didn't make any sense to kind of continue down that path. And that's when we started working on the white paper. And I suppose more importantly, thinking, you know, how does the Dojira token itself fit into a grander ecosystem with this? That we didn't want it to be another case of just simply token not needed or anything like that. So 
that was when we started developing up the actual plans we had for a staking farm and reaching out to other partners that were on, you know, starting up with AMMs, but in particular with Polycat, one of the newer AMMs at, you know, one of us, a very young age in its life cycle, that we want to kind of be with that kind of crowd, we're starting to push things in a direction that is relevant for consumers, rather than things which are really directly developer related. Because I think that we have a lot of good development tools already out there, we need to start actually taking advantage of them. So yeah, a lot of the Q3 goals were shifted around quite a bit for that. Uh, Q4, a lot of it really is, I suppose, to You'd have to nearly infer it from our white paper, but right now the main goals are getting our farm up and running, getting our proof of concept game out, uh, preferably you know integrated in with actual blockchain technology onto it, be it with an, its own token or on the actual Dojira token itself, and of course getting our Ethereum bridge up and running with full staking farm capabilities and deeper integration with the partners that we're bringing on board with it. That would be a lot of what we're doing for Q4, but. Again, Q4 is, uh, it's only literally just started. So there will be more to share on that in the near future. And we'll hope to get the website updated with more concrete information on that. What is the benefit of focusing development on staking farms rather than d developing a game? How does a staking farm tie into the game ecosystem? Yeah, so we have a lot of information on that in the white paper and we've spoken about it on a couple of AMAs now. So it's basically allowing Dojira to be essentially a gold standard for everything that we either develop in-house, publish, or even projects that we bring on as partners. That if we were to say bring out, let's take for example we make two new games and they both come out over the next quarter those two games would either have to have their own tokens or they'd have to share a token in being dojira now the simple option is like yeah just make everything share dojira but from a game design perspective that it's a nightmare you would have to have two economies that were perfectly in sync with each other and maybe we could get that working with two games released a couple of weeks apart but let's say we we're bringing out a game in four years time or what have you, when, you know, you've got deflationary effects, it might be into you know, another bull cycle and we don't know where things are going to go at that stage. It starts getting nearly unreadable. Like, let's say, let's just pick a purely pluck this out of air and, and say, you know, one Dojira is now equal to $50,000. Wouldn't that be great? But let's just say that that's the price that it ended up at. So we have game designers sitting down in four years time knowing that one Dojira is $50,000. They want to say, OK, but we need to make health and armor and, you know, weapons available in this game to people at a low level where they might have a dollar or two of Dojira. So are we going to move on to a Satoshi like standard where we start, you know, drilling down by the numbers on it? What happens if they release the game and then we go into, you know, a bull cycle and all of a sudden it's $20,000 per or $200,000 per Dojira. So all of a sudden, you know, that health potion, which costs 20 cent is now 80 cent and climbing. And again, these are, it's extreme examples to put it at that level where, you know, we're at 50 or $200,000 per Dojira. It'd be quite a market cap. But even when you scale that back down and say, you know, it was one cent per Dojira and all of a sudden it went up to 10 cent and we have developed a game around the idea of there being one cent in it. You'll have two games get completely out of whack with each other. Like one game could be experiencing a recession. The other could be experiencing a boom. There is really no good design point in having things tied to one token. So that then leads us back to the original question that if we're going to be making multiple games and they'll all have separate tokens between them, what's the actual point of having a Dojira token? So in sitting down and having a look over that, we wanted to make a way for people to be able to, I suppose, speculate on the wider ecosystem and in particular not need to understand the more complex dynamics of an in-game economy or anything like that. I mean, if you were to take a look at, say, anything from really EVE Online, which would be extremely complex, to World of Warcraft, which would be more simple, or just, you know, some of the older games, which was simply just deal in, you know, gold pieces and stuff like that. These economies are pretty intricate to people who don't actually jump into them and start figuring out how they all work. A lot of the time they wouldn't know if, you know, is it an inflatable supply? Are there enough actual deflationary sinks inside of it? Has it really been designed as an economy to withstand years of pressure? Or is it closer to, say, World of Warcraft, where, you know, inflation is just part of the deal and it will keep going up and that's part of the progression? So for people who wanted to get in on more so speculating on the products themselves, anything that we do develop and release, we can take a portion of the initial supply, put that up for staking 
through our actual farms and allow people to use their dojira to kind of directly speculate on that. With other smaller things then, like say holding a certain amount of dojira or spending a certain amount of dojira to unlock say cosmetics or small boosts within games, stuff like that, we can keep a tangible link between the two things without actually having it say without having it actually set up that, that they're deeply interconnected, but they can have a good interlinking between them and one can be used to stake out the other. Another important kind of part of that as well is depending on how Dojira is looking as we are releasing games on it, all of the games we release with tokens can have those tokens pegged to Dojira itself. So that is the actual trading currency that everything needs to go through. So it's I mean, yeah, you have to call this a very small thing on the overall, but if people were, say, using Dojira to directly purchase, you know, whatever tokens we release through any exchange, it's basically cutting down a little bit on that gas fee from routing, stuff like that. It just makes it more economical and more efficient to have the Dojira token itself. Lastly, then, the DAO governance system we have is going to be tied to just simply Dojira. I'm sorry, I was meant to mention that in our news update at the start. We had our first DAO vote. So anything that we do in any games we develop, if we're doing a governance vote on it, it will still be using Dojira. That is the overall governance system that we run with. So there's a lot of ways that we're kind of, you know, tying all of it into our game ecosystems and the staking farms. I think that that level of decentralized finance, it is actually more key to the game design that we're looking to build than anything else that you can't just say have a token not needed token that you're running with at all times if you if you're not able to stake in it and have tangible use with a tangible everyday use that allows you to be an early adopter in titles that we're actually developing on or even you know use them as part of pre-sales and stuff like that i think that the dojira token itself would have very little use so yeah it's not quite as fun in that we have to get all of that infrastructure up and running beforehand but Unfortunately, yeah, it can't be 100% fun on games all the time. So this is something that we need to do in order to really secure how Dojira is going to be built moving forward. And it's, yeah, it, it ties into it very deeply. I'd recommend taking a look through the white paper itself and seeing how we kind of discuss on that in detail. But yeah, it's a good question, though, and certainly something, certainly something that's worth knowing for anybody who is buying Dojira, what they're actually buying into. So yeah, it's a good question. One example that uh, that I like to make it make it's actually one that I made um, in the last uh, convention meeting that I had of sorts. The game on one it was uh, it was it was, it was a good convention. Um, is kind of like comparing how a currency is just regular currency, like a dollar bill or like a euro or something. The the currency is backed by well, in the old days it was backed by gold. And now it's backed by, yes, sometimes gold, but also the infrastructure, the economy as a whole, jobs, trading, military, etc. Dojira's token is kind of like that, except the infrastructure. Let me let me back that up a little bit. So Dojira's token is kind of like the gold, like Owen was saying, and the currencies that are within our ecosystem that are attached to those games are like currencies in, let's say, real life. And the backing is from not only the token, but the ecosystem or the infrastructure of Dojira itself. So every single game is kind of backing each other up. The community is backing those games up, and the list goes on. Yeah, absolutely. And like those are all, yeah, those are all brilliant examples of how that stuff can actually be interwoven into it. Like one of the biggest parts for me of it is you know, I don't want to, say, jump into an actual game economy and try and hold you know, that as an investment. I mean, could you imagine how wrecked you would be if you're playing World of Warcraft, you know, 10 years ago, you had a couple of copper or silver and you log back in thinking, you know, that's still worth money. I think a lot of people would have that, you know, similar outlook on it. You don't want to really hold a game economy's currency for too long, particularly if it's going down a more inflationary route. I mean, even in EVE Online, and that's incredibly well managed, it's still very inflationary. So it's kind of, you know, we don't want to have a tie that we need to create all of these economies to actually be, you know, deflationary economies with value added on every day to it because a lot of that value will come from re like circulating that actual currency that we're using rather than holding it tight so when we're looking at those era for you know that can be something that yes we want to add you know long-term value to that but we want to be able to develop games 
with game design in mind, not with full on, we have to make a, you know, a directly deflationary economy within a game world, even if it is completely against any design rules that we've put forward for it. So, yeah, I, I think that that's all kind of really important stuff to look at how we're going to have things pegged to the actual Dojira currency or token rather, uh, rather than having to sit there and just try to make one size fit all. Next question, what is the status of the BattleBot show? Uh, so right now, uh, I can't give any dates. Uh, that's not public yet, uh, but I mean, it's still going to run and most likely it will still run in 2021. I haven't heard of anything of it being delayed till 2022, so it should still be going live, whether it be in fall or uh, winter. Um, not like late winter, like January or something, but it should still be going uh, 2021. I'm not sure yet, though, but I'll keep you guys updated. Any updates on the web developer, new website, and two Unity dev hires? Uh, so two Unity dev hires, we can still not talk about that right now. Um, as for the web developer, he is on now. Uh, officially, we still have to update his bio and his uh, his picture. He's working with us on on uh, you know getting that new website rolled out. And he uh, you know keep in mind that uh, right now he's uh, he's part time on the project, but he's still helping out quite a bit, especially with the amount of experience that he has. But he is again still part of the team. Uh, Owen, would you like to speak briefly on the uh, the new website? Yeah, so it's likely that we'll see a minor update going on our current website before we actually start moving over to a new website, a more final one that we'll have for V2 and the future going forward. So yeah, in the meantime, you can expect to see a number of small updates on the current setup that we have. We're not in a massive rush to you know completely throw out what we have. We want to make sure that what we're getting built is going to be a more long-term thing without having massive time constraints on it to try and get it up and running on time. So are well on time rather we don't want to get it up and running before it's fully cooked so yeah we'll have any kind of relevant updates will still be going on to the current website we have but yeah really excited to see what we can build together and i suppose one of the larger things we had with every version of the dojira website that went up was we had no time to get it together we just had to quickly jump across onto new websites and like the one that's running right now was designed up by mary and developed by myself over the course of I think about three or four days I came down to. I think the design concept took about a week and then development was three or four days or maybe a little bit longer but I know I was working full time at the time so it was a very short amount of time we had to get everything working and I think everybody can remember we had a lot of same mobile compatibility issues some of which are still uh, cropping up every now and then and catching us by surprise. So yeah what we're building right now for the more permanent you know full version of it we're not putting any rush time frame on that. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing what we're able to sit down and get built with a more flexible time frame and with more dedicated staff members on it as well. Any plans on migrating to an additional chain, Solana, Avalanche, Cosmos? Uh, not right now. We still want to go ahead and continue development on Polygon, but we are definitely open to all possibilities like uh, the guy set up there. What is it called? Fan, Phantasma chain. I mean, we're going to research that. Uh, but right now, Polygon seems like the best option. Then, of course, uh, having those pairs on the Ethereum side as well. Uh, when will we get an update on the proof of concept? Uh, will SOS still be a thing? So a uh, brief note on that. Um, not only are we aware of crypto deadlines, but I have heard uh, a lot with um, it was it was one of the most recent Ask Me Anything. I went in there and a guy ended up talking to me about um like oh you know like he's like okay you guys are a blockchain gaming project right i'm like well yeah and he's like okay well where's your game i'm like okay well it's still it's still development proof concept he's like all right you guys can release a trailer you know i'm like um i mean <laughs> why like it's it's still in development i mean we can release a trailer but i'd rather do that if we did do that more towards a time when we can say that it's going to be released and then he's like oh it just takes you like a day or two or something you can just get something up and i mean think about whatever game let's say cyberpunk 2077 or you go to any other thing and it's like we have all of these engines that we can run this on you don't have that you can't afford that you know like makes it look like amazing it's like freaking 8k hd you know throw out whatever other buzzwords that will make the game actually look great and then you get it and it looks like mara mario on nintendo or something and i'm talking about like the old school one like the blow the blow the dust out of the cartridge one and it's like 
we want to make a game and if we do release any type of teaser trailer i mean we can release concept art in due time but we want to make sure that we focus on the game development and not try to wow every single person be like come on let's go and then when it eventually releases it's like oh yeah by the way that was a cinematic trailer i i mean like i i don't think the guy really understood what he's talking about i'm not, i don't have a technical background but i i'm i can assure you that it's not like that at all with uh game development when it comes to you know actually delivering a product versus hyping it up it's like there can be hype but it has to be realistic um as as for sos uh, like we discussed previously um that 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 can be ported up ported over that does have a possibility um but of course you know we we do want that uh our own proof of concept and everything too yeah so I suppose to expand on that, I am looking into it at the moment and doing a lot of the proof of concept stuff around, like a lot of the stuff that I'm kind of tying into is kind of building from projects that I would have had beforehand just to see, you know, what level of logic can I just offload onto the blockchain here? Or what would be useful to have on it? SOS is what I'm like, I spoke about this, I think two weeks ago in that it's a bit of an odd game for blockchain. It's because it suits perfectly and not perfectly at the same time. The actual logic being technically turn-based on there means that it would work extremely well in just simple logic and how the game works. The problem then is that the blockchain means you have all data visible at any one time. So Splitter Studio is kind of a game about trying to trick somebody, or well, trying to get them to believe you anyway, but you're withholding information. You literally cannot share information outside of your word. And that's the difficult part of it. Like, there are ways of getting around it. Of course, we can, um, you know, we can have a decent portion of it be running on a centralized server and just have, you know, results verification rather than actual game logic running on the blockchain. There's a couple of different ways we can go around doing it, but I am looking into it pretty closely at the moment, and we're hoping we'll have more details on it soon. Just right now, my development focus is on getting that Ethereum bridge up and running and also in getting, you know, our staking farm up and running as well. And there's a couple of admin things we're still taking care of in the background on top of all of that. So hopefully way more news on that stuff really soon. I was uh, going when? to jump in as well there, Skylar. Um, you're speaking about the cinematic trailer stuff in games. Yeah, so a good friend of mine is working at a studio and he has actually said to me before that when stuff like Gamescom or E3 are coming up, they typically have two teams in there. One is simply working on a trailer, which is completely detached from the game itself. And the other one is working on the game. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm yeah. not surprised. The, the trailers a... coming out are amazing. I, I mean, like Stalker 2. Have you seen the trailer on that? <laughs> yeah, they're... I want to play that. Is it going to yeah. be like that? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Yeah. Watchdog syndrome is uh, coming back to remind me of when reality does come home. I I can't wait till the uh, the Elder Scrolls actually uh, eventually actually releases. I mean that's going to be pretty good, but I I kind of want to see where the disconnect is from the trailer too. Then, but either way, yeah, it's <laughs> significant. I'm sure. Yeah, the Tesla uh, are pretty good for release trailers. Oh, absolutely. I, I love the, the live action one they did with Skyrim. That one was pretty cool. Yeah. I thought that yeah. was great. Absolutely. Uh, has there been internal discussion on whether to delay any major marketing pushes until after games complete or nearly so? Is such a decision within the realm of possibility? Of course, a decision that decision is within the realm of possibility. We're always looking at uh, marketing and when it should go live, when it shouldn't go live. It, it's it's a constant thing. It's not even just, you know, here it is. As, as for marketing in general, uh, and I'm talking about pushes on marketing. As for marketing in general, we're always doing that all the time. Uh, we want to have our name out there, whether it be just through the community, through various articles, through YouTube videos. As you guys have seen, there was a Crypto Zeus video. Owen did an interview with Crypto Windy, and we also had an Ask Me Anything on the Chainlink community chat. Uh, it was a public Twitter space. I had an Ask Me Anything with um, two communities. One was text-based, one was voice-based. We announced that both in Telegram and uh, Discord. I went to three conventions. Um, the latest one was the Game On convention. Um, it, so it's it's always going on trying to get our name out there. As for like pushes and everything, you, you know, we can't tell you that. I mean, you're going to see it. We'll post it up. If we tell you when there's going to be a marketing push, then increase speculation. And now we're literally telling you guys when to buy and sell. So. 
Um, Owen, if you want to add on to that. Yeah, it's the same as I said a couple of times before that I don't want to see you know a great amount of marketing heading out while we're developing products. The reality is if there's a budget there for marketing and we use it before we actually release anything, we're kind of relying on we're kind of relying on goodwill to nearly take us through um, from that. And yeah, when the market is just going up and up and up as it was back in, say, March, April, stuff like that, yeah, it can happen. It's not what I would like to put a long term, not what I'd like to put a long term business on or anything like that. Uh, when it comes to an actual game being complete, I don't think we need to wait that long to do any marketing. We will have, you know, some dry powder sitting on standby for when we do get, you know, a full release out and stuff like that. But right now, like, I mean, we don't have our, we don't have our Ethereum bridge up and running. Our website doesn't have, you know, details on our new partnerships on there yet. We don't have a staking farm or anything like that up and running either. So a lot of what we're looking at right now is what we're releasing and, you know, where it makes sense to kind of begin marketing on that. I think the fact that we are moved over onto Polygon and we have our ducks in a row as far as, you know, how Dojira is proceeding forward is well enough for the marketing that we're doing at the moment. But I wouldn't like to see, you know, I, I wouldn't like to see us in Times Square or anything like that, like taking that big a chunk out of the budget without having a little bit more to show for it. But the marketing team is continuing to work pretty hard on that. And Skylar is obviously overseeing everything on that level. I think right now we're moving at a pace that I personally am pretty happy with. But again, I'm the developer, so <laughs> I'm a little bit biased in that sense. I can understand what it's like when the market's starting to move up and you want to see move and follow. But from what I'm looking at right now, and again, as I said, I likely look at charts quite differently than others on here when it comes to Doge Europe because it's very, it's very easy for me to look at any price action when I know what's actually being developed in the background. But from what I'm seeing, we actually did beat out Ethereum today on a move up and beat out Matic as well. So, I mean, there are people aware of Doge Europe right now and people are starting to jump in on board. So I think the marketing we're doing is certainly starting to bear fruit. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, when centralized exchange. So yeah, we're still uh, we're still reaching out and speaking with um, CEX that we'd be interested in coming on board with. But like I've said beforehand, there's not a massive amount of distinction between the volume that we will actually see coming through a DEX and a CEX at the moment. And what we're more interested in are what kind of you know, what kind of partners can we work with in a more direct fashion to actually grow the token, find new holders with it outside of just putting up a banner on a website and stuff like that? I mean, a lot of the DAXs that we're able to work with right now, we're able to speak with basically the owners of them on nearly a first name basis. And, you know, these are people that are seeing they're basically seeing the turn of the market and, you know, some of the more actually some of the most talented developers that I've spoken with have all been involved in the automated market making systems that we see so commonly now and that are taking up such a massive amount of taking up such a massive amount of the market cap. I mean when I look at coin market cap and stuff like that now and yet we see all the tier ones and you see you know billions going through them a day. And a lot of the time I'm kind of sitting there thinking, you know, how much of that is basically scam wicking to deleverage people. <laughs> stuff like that or how much of it is you know wash trading i can't tell at all because they're not trading on the blockchain these are centralized i mean anything could be done to give those kind of volume reports so when i see stuff like you know the statistics from say uniswap or sushi swap or you know polycat or ape swap or quick swap and you know so on and so forth i know that those are realistic Th those are the actual numbers being pushed through them and it's also great in knowing that this is being funded like the liquidity is all being provided by traders as well that a lot of people think that you know dexs they're very unsafe because the liquidity could be pulled but when you actually have a tight contract i would say the dex is probably the safest place you can put your money or your tokens etc because you know there's liquidity backing it so for me like i'm very much when i look at cex's i see it as something that yes we do want to have a tier one cex just to make it way more accessible to jump in with dojira and pick up your first tokens especially if you just want to hold them and you're not interested in farming or gaming etc but in the more short-term future i'm just way more interested in you know reaching out and making new partners connections in the dex areas where we have a lot of liquidity provided right now i think we're 
I'm not sure of the exact number. I didn't do a check on it today, but I saw Polycrystal has incentivized, it was about $90,000 worth of liquidity, which is just gigantic. And people are staking that up and they're getting Polycrystal in return for it. And I believe the APR is over 100% on that as well. And like that's incentivizing, you know, traders like everybody in here to provide liquidity and be able to actually see a return from it. So that's something I'm way more interested in personally, but I do understand the market need to have more tier one offerings available, let people jump in a little bit quicker on it. But I just feel the need to stress on it that having the tokens on a DEX, it really is not the actual, I suppose, hurdle that it used to be. A lot of people are getting very used to the idea of decentralized trading now. I think Ethereum gas prices are all that really stopped it for the last while, but the act the absolute explosion we've seen in other layer ones and layer two rollups, et cetera, all comes down to the fact that people are learning more about how they can jump back into the decentralized finance side of crypto. And like this is how we provide it all through DEXs. I, mean, I think that CEXs will always be around, but I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a lot of the CEXs actually run a DEX by the next, you know, within the next two or three years. Like, I'd be very surprised. I think Binance already have one that's kind of running. One of you might correct me on that. I haven't looked into it too much, but I know there was a peer to peer system that they were building on it. But yeah, DEXs, I think, have a lot more sway right now outside of, you know, futures trading and stuff like that. Because um, right now, anybody I know who runs through a CEX simply for on-ramp, off-ramp, futures trading, if that's what they do, uh, but not a whole lot of not a whole lot of picking up of tokens. Sometimes stuff like Litecoin, where they just don't want to install a wallet, but that'll be you know short-term holding. They're not planning on keeping it. They're just looking to flip a trade. And again, way open for arguments on this one and to hear other people's opinions on it. But it is still it's still an important milestone that we do want to hit, but we're not kind of pausing the work that we're doing elsewhere to focus solely on the tier one CEX. I mean, uh, I, I really think that decentralized, uh, decentralized exchanges, decentralized trading is is probably the best route for people to increase adoption of crypto in general, because that's like the first step. You're becoming your own bank, essentially. And then that wallet is kind of like your credit card. So the address is your bank, the wallet's your credit card. And it's it's kind of like really taking control of the funds that you have and going with it rather than, you know, having a bank hold your hand, kind of like a centralized exchange. It's it's good to you know, kind of, you know, move money around, especially with transferring to U.S. dollars uh, now. Um, but I, I really think that people should learn a little bit more about wallets and on-chain addresses, et cetera, and be kind of more in control of, of all their funds. Yeah, and that's a lot of what we're doing with the tentatively named Dojira University. We want to get people, you know, more studied up on this kind of stuff because there's a lot in decentralized finance right now, which is really paving the way for essentially the actual future of finance. It's... um. Like one of the biggest things I have right now is that a lot of people I know that have switched over to using MetaMask and, you know, any other wallets that they're holding on, you know, their actual hard drive and how I have a hardware ledger hooked up to, et cetera. This is one of the first times I know most people that have their crypto, you know, they own their keys. They don't have all the stuff in an exchange. I mean, I've, uh, I'm example number one of why you shouldn't trust a centralized exchange for too long and i was on cryptsy when again it was a couple of million dogecoin a couple of thousand litecoin this was back in 2013 2014 so very differently valued and it's obvious enough to say that no i would not have held on to that level of litecoin and dogecoin until today's kind of prices but if you're thinking on that yourself, that, you know, you're buying stuff that you might be holding for years to come, the only safe place you can have that is your own keys, your own wallet. You don't keep that stuff in an exchange long term. Exchange is for, you know, on ramp, off ramp futures, if they provide it or any other functionality that you might be interested in. Again, I'd recommend against futures, obviously. It's a, a risky game to play with if it's your thing. You can do that through a CEX. I believe there are DEXs offering stuff like that now. But that is kind of what I would look at when it comes to the use case of an exchange, as a centralized exchange. Everything else, I mean, if you have Matic on your MetaMask and you go to pick up some Dojira, I'm pretty certain that the transfer fee for even one Matic's worth of Dojira is less than what you would pay on a centralized exchange. 
again, I might, I'm open to correction on that one. But when you're talking fractions of fractions of a cent, especially if you're picking up something like, you know, 100,000 uh, Dojira or a million, etc., there's practically no transfer fee on Polygon. So once we're moved over onto this kind of chain, I would massively recommend if, you know, anybody's hold, holding on Whitebit or, you know, still holding on Hotbit while we try and get uh, the V2 token airdropped on there. Sorry, just a heads up. We are working closely on that one. Hope to get you all switched over as soon as we can with it. Just waiting on a couple of things from Hotbit's end, but we're hoping again that it was solved in, yeah, in short order. But if you are, you know, just holding your tokens on those exchanges at the moment, do consider setting up MetaMask, putting the Polygon network on there. We'll have videos that will walk you through all of this very soon. A couple of them are already up on our YouTube, but put it on there and even have a look at stuff like, you know, putting a small amount into liquidity to farm other tokens or, you know, if you're to farm, say, Dojira and pick up Paw, that's a token that is operated by our partners over at Polycat. You can mix them into liquidity, you can farm more paw, and you can actually then stake your paw for more Dojira. So it's basically not allowing you know your tokens to sit idle. You put them to work for you. It's the same as say sushi. Um, so I hold a lot of the sushi token, one of my favorite exchanges, and I have that staked. And it sits there accruing value. It doesn't matter if the market is up or down. Every transfer that goes through the Sushi exchange is reflected back into the X Sushi token that I'm holding. If I was on an exchange, I can't hold that. I can only hold the regular Sushi with no staking. So this is all stuff that we're going to cover over in the videos that we're building at the moment. But I would really recommend, you know, start looking into that. And you can make your crypto do a lot more for you when it's in your own wallet than but essentially somebody else's wallet on an exchange. Can you say if any future games will require us to use a different wallet than MetaMask to utilize any blockchain related benefits? I don't believe so, um, Owen. Yeah, no, right now, uh, everything I'm working with has been with MetaMask. So right now I can't say that there's going to be anything different put into that. Uh, it's possible that, you know, it may come up at a future stage that there's something we need to use something else for. But right now, I can't see anything other than MetaMask being used. Are you currently looking for a third-party agency to fill the role of Emerco since Dojira parted ways with them? I don't believe so, Owen. No. Um, so right now, I think it's more important for us to make sure that, make sure that we're not kind of to the behest of any timelines we may not be able to hold I suppose, full responsibility over. So right now, everything we're doing, again, has gone back to internal work on it. But we are getting on top of it. And obviously, you know, we're hiring on. We, we brought on a new web developer. We have the other Unity developers as well that we'll be you know speaking more about in the near future, hopefully. I think right now it's better to try and get as many of our resources kind of in-house on the development side as we can. So, yeah, it's going to be internally. So all of the development workload that was being handled by themselves is now currently being handled by myself but we're going to keep it that way for a little bit longer just until we can have our core infrastructure up and running it's just something that's very important for us to get right rather than get done fast don't get us wrong we're still going to be using contractors if needed but you know obviously it's we we do want to do a lot of stuff in-house yeah Has and this, this is the infrastructure that we're building. And the reality was that I was spending more time on code reviews than I would have been coding. So it just made sense to move those those responsibilities back over to myself at that stage. Uh, when Billy Marcus joined the dev team. Uh, uh, I, I actually found um, a bunch of our old messages from back in 2013 and 2014. They're pretty funny. They're like little nuggets of history now. I might po post up a couple of them on Twitter if Billy is okay with it. But um, yeah, Billy is currently working with bringing, I think, Dogecoin over onto, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not sure if he's settled on looking at actual Ethereum itself or if he's looking at a layer two roll up or whatever. But um, yeah, I might reach out to him and see if he'd be okay with me posting up some of the messages we had back in the early days. A lot of them are very funny to look back on, especially in how we kind of very casually talked about, you know, what's essentially a multi-billion dollar uh, market cap coin today. And just the stuff that we looked over on. I mean, there's one email I have, uh, this one's from Jackson. And it was me saying, look, I think we should move to the X11 algorithm. Um, you know, S-Script, uh, script, if you prefer, is seeing a lot of ASICs pop up on it. And 
<laughs> I have the email reply saying, oh, I don't think ASICs would be a problem for a long time yet. And I think it took six months until the market was flooded with ASICs and GPUs were just not usable anymore. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff in there like that, which I mean, I even believe that, yeah, there probably won't be an issue for too long, you know, and just being over paranoid about it. So yeah, it's funny to look back and see the things that we spoke about and what what went right, what went wrong, stuff like that. So yeah, I'll, uh, I might actually reach out to him, see if he's okay with that. And yeah, who knows, maybe you will be able to get him interested in joining Polygon as well. I think that would actually be a great platform for NFTs. It hasn't really, it hasn't really seen an NFT boom yet, even though it has you know, all the technology is there for it. Yeah, let's let's bring them on board. We'll get them uh, get Dogecoin integrated into the ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could be my next bridge. There we go. When Dojira slash Dogecoin NFT rollout, I don't know, man. That'd be pretty cool, though. You know, have part of our ecosystem, or even have a have a kind of collab or anything. I have I have people that I can contact to get generational NFTs going for them and everything. You know, contacts. But yeah, who who knows? You know, the future could hold anything. Um. So Owen, if you want to expand on anything or answer anything else you saw in there. Yeah, absolutely. So on general NFTs, um, I'm really looking forward to us being able to actually ramp up in that area again. We did a lot of NFTs back in the early, well, a lot. Uh, we did four <laughs> back in the early days, but they were all very successful in their own right. So that's something that, you know, I'm really looking forward to us being able to sink our teeth back into again. And that's, you know, inclusive of um, the non-use case NFTs, ones that might just, well, a use case is in, you know, it might just come with an airdrop or a digital download, stuff like that on it. Ones that don't have to be tied inexorably to, you know, a gaming experience or anything like that. So yeah, on the NFT front, really hoping we can start spinning up on that again soon. Just right now, our resources are basically just backed up against the wall. But yeah, in the near future, uh, we'll hopefully start seeing all of that stuff start rolling out again. And it would be really cool to get, I suppose, uh, collaborator NFTs running as well, especially with the partners that we have at the moment. Like um, I've been looking at, you know, the Wireframe Cat on Polycat, and I think that would actually make a really cool NFT. So yeah, stuff like that, you know, doing collaborations with the partners that we have at the moment and future partners as well. I think that that's, um, I think that's all really cool stuff that we have to look forward to. When Metaverse Dojira Hangout. So we, of course, got that invite from Gamer Jibe to just make a Metaverse and, and go from there. So, I mean, of course, I'm going to be looking at that and kind of monitoring what's uh, like what they're doing right now. They just have a basic like jump, walk, wave high emoji type system going on, and they're going to be expanding on that. So once it gets a little bit bigger and there's like, um, you know, multiple Metaverses like within or not multiple metaverses, but there's a metaverse and then there's a Dojira quote unquote club and there's other clubs around, then we can absolutely start going uh, going along that way. Uh, we, of course, still have our Saturday night game nights. So if you guys do want to join up, I'll be now, since I we have a Twitch and we are streaming the Sasme thing on Twitch, I might as well stream the games on there as well. And if you guys want to stream on Discord, you want to join up whenever. Um, we're also going to be playing maybe a game or two after this ask me anything so if you guys want to join just let me know um what's the next big milestone for dojira in your opinions my opinion would be uh developing on our ecosystem and getting our game rolled out i, th I mean i mean that and the staking farms of course because that is the start of our ecosystem yeah so for me i suppose it's more kind of like straight down the road on it that get the get the uh, ethereum bridge up and running get our staking farm up and running and once that's done i'll be able to breathe a heavy sigh of relief and go kind of full time again then on the actual game development side of things so yeah for me it's getting to that level that's what i'm really looking forward to and hopefully we get there very soon what is your favorite food mary skylar want to know was too scared to ask <laughs> that was just an example yes yeah, so i was scared i don't know what to say what a, what yeah. mary uh, we're gonna have to get you up on the stage to talk about food for 10 minutes yeah <laughs> if you want to join feel free i think she likes um takoyaki you can explain what that is to people mary well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll google the meaning of it hang on taco well, yeah. as for as for Owen, it's chicken and rice. As for yeah. me, I, I like all food. So, okay, so takoyaki or octopus balls, wonderful, is a ball shaped Japanese snack made of a wheat flour based batter and cooked in a special molded pan. It is typically filled with minced or diced 
octopus, tempura scraps, pickle ginger, and green onion. Well, those are actually they're they're pretty good. There's some restaurants that make them, and there's like there's like some some hollow stuff, and it just it doesn't taste good because it's just like fried. And maybe that's just like an American thing. We just we want extra fry on there, extra fries. Oh, Mary! Is oh, Mary's up. Stage. There you go, Mary. You get to explain takoyaki and why you're eating octopi. <laughs> Uh, because it's, uh, I don't know, I'm actually just in love with Asian cooking and uh, <laughs> for the very first time I'm appearing in Emma, I'm talking about food. <laughs> yes, I just love Asian cooking and I'm pretty good on doing it. A1. Awesome, um, you'll have to make some orange chicken for the team. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, uh, yeah, oh yeah, it's, yeah, after looking up takoyaki there, I'm just remembering... So back when I was in industry and games development, we were brought out for a fancy meal after. Wow, uh, Mary, you've a lot of fans. <laughs> I don't even get reactions like that, Mary. You are loved. But um, so we were over uh, getting this fancy meal at a steak and fish food place. They brought out the appetizers for it. And they just brought out basically my starter, which was like kind of like a champagne glass. And it just had octopus tentacles sticking out of it. like. I thought that kind of thing was only what cartoon villains eat, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I found out that day I don't like octopus. It just, well, this, like you can see the suckers on the tentacle. I did not like it at all. Octopus is good, but for for me personally, like I've had, um, I've had sashimi. fried squid tentacle. Like, no, okay. you want, you, that has to be a joke. Nobody eats a deep fried squid. Right? If you if you dice it up, like like takoyaki, uh, but if you dice it up, it's good, it, you know. But if it's just like the entire, th- I don't know. I guess it's like the texture too might be. It's definitely the texture. Rest. It. I find oh, that yeah. octopus is definitely eatable if it's like nice and crispy, nice. like on the outside, and it's got a bit of like it's like a bit of firmness. But if it's all squishy and slimy, I, I just can't deal with it. Yes, yeah, so that's we, what it was. Horrible. Yeah, what's your what's but, your um, favorite food, Dan? You got to answer. Is it Vegemite? <laughs> uh, I used to, I used to eat a lot of Vegemite uh, when I was a kid, but uh, when you grow up, you sort of go, "Oh, it's really just eating a lot of yeast." Um, favorite food at the moment? Look, to be honest, we've been eating um, a lot of sushi lately. Uh, I think that's because uh, my partner and I we've been working a lot of hours and then been studying as well, so we've been eating out. And sushi, funny enough, is what we've been eating. Um, I am a huge fan of soft shell crab. I am absolutely nuts for it at the moment. I know that's probably not what everyone wanted to hear. No, no, dude, crab meat. I get that. Absolutely get crab Mm. meat. Uh, Sushi, like, I'm a terrible sushi eater because I always got, um, what's what's the sushi? It starts with another T, I think, but basically it meant cooked sushi because I don't like raw fish. It's just a given. I'm sorry, I don't. Uh, But crab crab meat. No, not tempura. It was um. It sounds like takoyaki. I'm sure. That's what I thought that was. That's what I was just saying it wrong. That's um, why Dan doesn't mind the crabbing chart. <laughs> <laughs> has yeah. Has Dan ever boxed a roux? Dan, have you ever boxed a roux? Uh, funny enough, um, yep, I have physically <laughs> assaulted a, a kangaroo, but um, we found a kangaroo that was sort of stuck in a dried up uh, dam. So essentially, it's just like a if you ever go into like a like man made dams out on farms, they're just like a it's really it's just mud essentially is the floor. You know, it was a bit of a drought at the time. A kangaroo got stuck in it and we had to get it out. So we dragged it out. And when we finally got it out, we had one person on the tail because we knew it was probably going to try and bite us. And one person held the tail and then it was trying to box. So we got the camera and recorded the kangaroo trying to box us. <laughs> but we, we never actually physically assaulted the kangaroo. We uh, we let it go straight after uh, as soon as we got it out properly. So uh, I was just waiting for that story to turn to crap. Like saying, oh yeah, the kangaroo was stuck. So I just went over and assaulted him. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. Let's see. We don't got any other questions. So if you want to do an outro, Owen, or if you guys want to expand on anything, Mary, Dan, anybody. Yeah, that's, um, I guess over the last week, or over the last two weeks, rather, a lot of the work that's been going on has been in the background. And yet we know it can be painful to sit there and kind of wait for more news to appear, stuff like that. As usual, the whole team is working extremely hard in the background and over the next two weeks, you're going to start seeing a couple of things come out from us, see the partnership that we've been working on in the background. And we're really looking forward to starting to roll all of that stuff out. Like it was a 
pretty painful couple of months in general while we're waiting on the move over to Polygon. But now that we're able to actually show off, I suppose, you know, the fruits of all the work that was done during that time. Like it's kind of been fantastic to see the community get more active, see, you know, more people picking up the tokens, see new faces appearing in the chat. And uh, yeah, one thing I really wanted to call out was Anytime I look at the community, it's been incredibly welcoming to anybody who's jumped into the chat with any questions. And I, I don't think I've seen, I don't think I've seen anybody join in without getting a warm welcome and, you know, people talking to them and enthusing about the actual product itself. So it's really nice to see that instead of, you know, a lot of, a lot of telegrams you can go into and you see you saying, you know, what's the functionality of this token? And somebody would reply with, uh, it, the functionality is the price goes up, so buy it, <laughs> okay? But then um, we've had like really nice level-headed discussions in our Telegram where people have talked about the product, they've linked the white paper, they've you know talked about what we've done since V1, what's coming up now on V2. So yeah, kudos to everybody in the community for that. It's just been really cool to see, and especially seeing it on Twitter as well, just seeing Dojira get tagged, even you know seeing myself get tagged in a couple of things when it's talking about you know technologies that are relevant to what we're building which have been really really humbling to see that stuff so absolutely keep it up uh, you're all doing fantastic as a community yeah thanks guys uh last question it seems and then we're <laughs> gonna go ahead and bounce to zone feel guilt when eating potatoes given their scarcity ouch <laughs> Yeah, the, fam the famine ended a while ago. Uh, we're allowed to eat, you know, many potatoes now. The one thing that's odd is, you know, blight is pretty solved by now. You just spray your potatoes and that's pretty much it if you're uh, if you're a farmer. I still get yellow alerts, like yellow weather alerts on my phone for blight. It's like that hasn't been a problem since we had the smartphone. <laughs> so oh. I was wondering, like, did somebody install a joke app to give me warnings about the blight? Like, no, I, I literally get warnings about the blight on my smartphone in 2021. So thank you, technology. You would have been much more helpful a while ago, but it's good to have it now. So in other words, he can't talk about it because they only issue one russet potato a week. <laughs> so, um, other than that, guys, uh, if you don't have anything else, we're going to go ahead and uh, bounce on out of here. And um, let me see, is there anything that is coming up that I can tell you guys about right now? Um, no, that should be about it. So uh, just make sure that you're staying up to date with uh, the Medium article, which is going to be coming out on the 11th on all the announcements in the Discord channel and Telegram channel and Twitter. Please make sure that you also pass that info to people that aren't in the know. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks a million all. And yeah, we'll speak soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Later, Zol. Bye. See you later.